brains are being lost children, which I think is, is very definite evidence of not, not just uh, that they are influenced first, but also that there is auditory maturation going on in the cortex. Because the cortical auditory potentials are the best biomarkers we have today of auditory uh, maturation. Uh, and that's very important because it tells you that with auditory experience, the auditory cortex actually you know, gets better and better in listening. And uh, we know that uh, as the auditory age increases with cognitive plants, latency comes down. Similarly, you can also show in, in brain cell implants that the latency comes down and therefore there's additional evidence of the maturation going on. But there exists a gray zone. Uh, between cochlear implants and brain. What I'm going to be doing today is to be showing you some of these uh, uh, cases you know, or equations where I have not been sure myself. You know, I have had doubts. I'm still not sure of many of them. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to tell you what uh, is correct in the situation, but just to show you my fallibility in, in decision making process, which seems to be only increasing you know, with uh, more and more because patients coming in a way. But I think these challenges are important because yeah. that's the bedrock on which our, our future progress is going to be made. And I, I suspect that the pediatric brain cell implant is, is, uh, is in its infancy now. And I have a feeling it's going to grow uh, quite a bit in the coming years. And partly because I, I think the, the real problem with brain cell implant is our uh, so speech coding strategies. Uh, I think we have we really use the popular implant strategies for brain cell implant. I'm, I'm very sure that that's not the right thing to do. So probably with uh, better appreciation, uh, our strategies may change in the future and uh, may become better. And we may be able to give a lot of people more meaningful information uh, in the future. Also, improvements in imaging and electrophysiology have helped us uh, in the decision making process, but not always, not always, uh, as you should see in all the cases. Uh, the first one is uh, I've never tired of uh, showing this, as I'm sure a lot of you have seen before, but I just want to recapitulate this patient. Now, uh, she uh, is a very, comes from a very eminent family, particularly from Andhra Pradesh. Her, her uh, grandfather is one of the pioneers of uh, India's nuclear program a very eminent scientist. The grandmother died of NF2 surgery, uh, you know, about, uh, I think more than uh, 60, 70 years ago. Her mother uh, had surgery for NF2 at the Halsey Institute and ended up with a facial palsy on both sides. Uh, and that was about 40 years ago, uh, and bilateral facial palsy. And she went through her whole life. Then. And this girl is, is very smart. Uh, she's a very, very smart girl. She actually did an uh, MBA from Wharton's Business School. And she's one of the uh, CEOs of one of the top uh, companies in the world, multinational companies based out of Singapore. And to add to my miseries, she was also my son's very close friend and, and class fellow. And they schooled together college together, when they invest together. So you can imagine my, uh, you know, uh, pretty woman, when she came one day, she pulled me up from Singapore and came and said, until uh, I started developing digits in my uh, That was the first time. So uh, somewhere in 2006 or seven, so in 2008, uh, so we died for two for her, and in 2008 she had a, a, a total removal of left acoustic Although our team has a lot of experience with the uh, you know, uh, role of acoustic tumors, I decided that I would not operate on her. A, because I wasn't too sure about preservation of cochlear nerve, I was very sure about preservation of facial nerve. And B, because she happened to be very, very uh, close to the family as well. So I, I spoke to uh, my uh, very close friend, uh, Joe Payat, in the uh, House Institute, and took her to the House Institute. And did the photo uh, removal with preservation of facial nerve and cochlear. I was there with the surgery and I saw the, uh, the whole procedure. She came back, so we, uh, we 
Chennai and promptly, uh, uh, three days after the handy, she wrote the higher so This is a very high so We did a, a GP shunt, which is fine after that. This was 2008. So that's just a pre op MRI showing you the LF2 uh, after surgical. You can see the nerve uh, being preserved, of the nerves and the popular nerve degree being preserved. So now the, the situation is uh, unfolding. The anatomical preservation of the left popular nerve is possible. <coughs> so the, uh, we felt very happy about it. But then, you know, uh, Ranjit did a, a prom still on her post op, and there was no response. And then we said, okay, we were transplanting the EMDR, and again, there was no response. And meanwhile, the right side hearing, which is good, started going down. Went down right of the night test. So hearing aid was no longer helpful. And mind you, this is a girl who is a high flyer, who is right on top of the chain, poor chain. You know, and she is based out of Singapore and one of the top uh, companies in the world. And the name BA from Boston. So we can have these back on some of the top families from India. Speech discrimination, that's the third person. So here again, it's not a big one. So we thought, now mind, we know that the nerve is dead. Even trans dependent EAP is not working, form stem is not working. Let's do a puncture implant. So a puncture implant as a first step. And then we thought we'd do a tumor removal on the right side. And then if we, you know, we think about a puncture implant, or probably a brain stem implant. But unfortunately, the cochlear implant did not work on the left side. So an anatomical preservation of the nerve is not the same as functional preservation. So that's one important lesson that we learned. So now the question of tumor removal on the right side with a brain stem implant on the left right side of the table. So this is now the current plan of action and she is now waiting for this to be done. So that's the first uh, problem that I started facing. The second was a 11 year old boy with bilateral profound cochlear loss who developed an episode of pneumococcal meningitis. A hearing loss was diagnosed soon after, one week after the onset of meningitis. All the other pain loss are common. And unfortunately, an ENT surgeon actually advised them to wait for six months. This is the tragedy. So we still have people who believe that after six months, the patient is going to sit below the Bodhi tree and have a splash of uh, lightning hitting them and get them back together. So this is a very sad situation. So no hearing, obviously no hearing improvement was noted. Child was referred for a CI evaluation. And test confirmed by that. But this time, child had another bilateral lateral death is also perhaps. And again, the prom stem and TTF are done and both resonated. There's no response. <coughs> so that's the scenario. You can see the uh, right side is a little better than the left side. You can have a ghost on the uh, of the monkey on the left side, a little better on the right side. But bilateral is significant positive. So what was the day I had? Do a basal turn, drill out. And uh, my big question which was in my back of my mind was, uh, you know, especially after the previous experiences, negative prom stem and EABR, are they indicators of central damage? Or indicators of uh, the, uh, is it indicating that the thing is not going to work? And then should be in that case opt for a CI or an So what we did was we said, okay, we'll go ahead and do it. Got a, I got a compressed electrode right here, full insertion after a drill out. Left ear, I took about nine electrodes. Left ear, implant performance is not satisfying. Some person, the child can't manage the left side, but the right side was fine and the child is managing the child. Now the question, parents want me to remove the left side implant and put it in the ear. I don't know what to tell them. So I've been uh, holding on right time, but this is the back of my mind. Third is a, a two-year-old child with a, from Sri Lanka with bilateral congenital hearing loss. 
as many kind of excellent uh, bilateral not bomb up there in this week. Both problems in the nerves were uh, normal and milestones were poor but rapidly improving we saw that. Chatter had arrived Copy implantation in 2009. Post op, check X ray was normal, therefore it was fine. And post CI, we had auditory perception with nine accurate things. That's the number one in the MR. Post implantation, about I think six months later, we could see that the electrode had migrated. And there were two electrodes in the so, uh, the other thing, this taught me a lesson that just because an electrode is in position uh, immediately post operator doesn't mean that it will not change later. So, they have the mind of their own, you know, and you know, necessarily reflect your expectations. So, what do I do now? You know, the, the nine anti electrodes in the cochlea, a couple of electrodes in the ignorant images, the child has auditory percept. Definitely here, although in spite of intensive auditory habitation, I think two years uh, had already gone by and overall progress is unsatisfactory. It's not a lot of speech, but where is the implant and response to sounds. So, do I uh, remove the cochlear implant and put them in the This is what the, the mother wants, the parents want. Do we continue the same implant? This is what I want. Uh, or so should we strike a compromise and leave the electrode as it is on this side and do an ABI on the other side? So this is probably what we end up doing, I think. But this is uh, again shows you uh, one of the dilemmas that I've been facing. Here's a four and a half year old child. You can see the autogram, bilateral getting loss, situated to form. Normal cochlea, both sides. Cochlear nerve absence. Patient nerves, present visible nerves. The child has different auditory sensation. The absence, in spite of the absence of the cochlear nerve. Fitted with the hearing aid, uh, you know, much against my uh, better judgment, and has been my underway habitation for nearly eight months with very little benefit. But there's no doubt that the child is here. So what do we do now? You know, so we need to go ahead. Do we put in a popular implant with the hope that because the child has got some auditory perception, there's some popular fiber breaks away. Just that the present image technology is not picked it up. Or do we go straight ahead to the of the implant? Keep in mind that whether it's a popular implant or a base of the implant, the patient's parents are going to be the level. So they don't come under the wrong key and they don't come state. So, you know, if I say cochlear implant and then it doesn't work into a basal implant, it's easy to say that, but I'm not paying for it on the parents of it. So keep that in mind. So this is the next dilemma. Now, this is the last case, and I just saw this patient, I think about three years ago. Uh, again, a very smart young lady, her uh, 20s. Bombay, and uh, she is uh, a very uh, successful executive. Bilateral uh, process, left here, a popular implant was attempted in Bombay, a very competent surgeon. <coughs> and uh, in fact, I was actually, uh, you know, uh, live when surgery was going on, because surgery was actually talking to me. But surgery, surgery had to be abandoned, uh, just couldn't get the implant in despite every effort. Now the patient is currently using a hearing aid, although she's got a bilateral performed loss, right? There's some residue here. She's using a hearing aid right here, and she's managing very well with the treating and the hearing aid. She's managing very well. So she does not want to offer the plant right here, and, and that's the current situation now. That is a total white hour. But on the right side, you can see still the, 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 the shadow. <coughs> I, I was pretty confident that I could get a computer to run the I was pretty confident that I had convinced that. But she, understandably, has a lot of reservations. She had surgery in a very good center with a very competent surgeon. She wrote exactly the same thing, but just couldn't do it. 
and also because this is the only year with which she is surviving now. And she is managing the gaming aid and she is managing to hold on to a good job. So this is a better scenario. So now what do I tell her? Do I tell her, let's do an ABI in the left chair. And we know now that a brain cell implant in motosclerosis, far and one motosclerosis works much better than in NF2. So they, they get better results. Do I convince her somehow and do a right chair pocket in front? Or do I do a step down to the right chair? I don't know. The answer is I don't know. So, this very crowded slide I just put up because uh, Levin, uh, Levin Central managed to get all this together from various brain center plant teams for a meeting in uh, Northern Cyprus. And that was indeed a silver an experience. And Amit was there as well. He did not say this is super spread by the job, but Indian government said we can't put it on site. We managed to smuggle through the border. <laughs> and uh, we all had a very useful, fruitful you know, uh, brainstorming session for two days. Everyone sharing their experience. And at the end of it, we came up with this very crowded slide. So to, to make things easy for you, the current gray zones are common cavity. But we know that some cases do well in front, in front some don't do well. IP1, to me now, if I see an IP1, I think I would counsel for a brain cell implant or a bacterial implant. Because definitely, in my hands, a PWP brain cell implant works better than a bacterial implant for an IP1. IP3 is a bit iffy, you know, it's a bit iffy. Uh, we still would do a bacterial implant and then see how it goes. Hypoplastic ocular nerve, again, you know, we're uh, not too sure because we really don't have any proper guidelines about what we call a hypoplastic ocular nerve. It's a rule of thumb. We say if it's 50% or less than normal you know, diameter or volume of ocular nerve, we call it hypoplastic. But uh, just the other day, I did a ocular implant in a hypoplastic ocular nerve. I tell you that exception where we got very good uh, responses to doing that. Well. So we don't know. An unbranched ocular vesicular nerve, again, is a dynamo. You know, we're not too sure what, what to do. Post meningitic, dense ocular calcification. And again, as I said, when you preserve the ocular nerve, okay, then these are all the current material zones. I think uh, this hopefully will become shorter as time goes on. As part of the prognostic indicators, what are the things we can cling on to? If there is a behavioral response, I believe it's a favorable favor of a plant. If you have a DTE ABI, I'm sure the children very happy to get it. That means it's a very good diagnosis. And if you have an agency AP uh, with a indicator, again it's a, it's a very good diagnosis indicator. Of course technology should help, you know, with an ARS go to bed CAP and all these are really helpful I think in helping us to resolve that. But finally push comes to shower in a difficult situation where there are no clear cut solutions. The surgeon, I think, has to adopt the policy of trial and error. You may not always be welcomed uh, by the patient or the family, but I think you have a responsibility to, to you know, take a, a sensible decision there. Difficult situations and unfortunately modern critical solutions. They often require crucial decision making <coughs> process, both intra as well as post office. I've given you a few examples of the great zone. These have been problems that have taunted me over the last 24, 20 years. But I think the answer is not clear even now. At least to my mind and what we So thank you very much. No, no, I thought I thought that you would like to take my No, I want your cell, I mean. Okay.